How much responsibility do you feel that you have, particularly to guys at the alt right, who, as you say, some of them have enjoyed your work and say, no, I'm, not one of, I'm not one of you guys, I'm not with you guys. They haven't enjoyed my work. I, I've definitely read bits on the internet. Read more. What is it that you have that no one else has? What are you offering that no one else is right now? Well, I think, I think that is what I'm offering. I, that, that's not part of the public discussion. You know, and it's grounded in my clinical knowledge. So I've been a clinician for a very long time, and I'm familiar with the works of most of the great 20th century clinicians and a reasonable amount of philosophy and a good swath of literature. And I'm a credible scientist, and so I can bring that all together. And I've tried to bring it all together and to make a case for the significance of individual life and the psychological necessity of courage and nobility and responsibility, these things that sound old-fashioned, but are old-fashioned in the best sense. They're old-fashioned because they've lasted forever and they're absolutely necessary. And people need a call to responsibility because they need to mature. They need to want to be adults. You know? And I don't think we do a very good job in our culture of making a case for why it's a good thing to be an adult. And two things really made you famous, which is, first of all, is the book, 12 Rules for Life. Mm -hmm. The second one, I think, was a, an interview that went viral with Kathy Newman of, of Channel 4 News, which mm -hmm. she talked about Joe men Rogan's and women. Joe podcasts help plenty. Too. Right, he's got a big, big following. But that was, I think, really fascinating, that interview, because it was specifically mm -hmm. about men and women. And you said at the time, you know, YouTube skews very male and your fan base is very male. Mm -hmm. Is that still the case? Are you still mostly primarily talking to men? Um, I would say the talks are probably 60, 40, 65, 35, male to female. The book sales, I don't know. I doubt it because it's usually it's women who buy books, although men do buy nonfiction if they buy books. We don't know the demographics on the books. Um, but the book has definitely expanded my um, audience, I would say. Um, and that's a good thing as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I never set out specifically to talk to men. My students for most years at the university have been primarily female. I think most of my graduate students have been female. It might be about 50-50, but I think it would probably tilt more in the direction of female. So it wasn't, like, it wasn't something I set out to do. Um, I think, though, that, as I said earlier, well, I can't tell how much of it is merely a consequence of the fact that YouTube skews so male. It might also be something to do with the call to take on voluntary responsibility. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that would be more necessary for men right now. I think it might be because our culture confuses men's desire for achievement and competence with the patriarchal desire for tyrannical power. And that's a big mistake. Those aren't the same thing, even a bit. So, and it's very inappropriate psychologically and sociologically to confuse them. So. Well, one of the things I want to come back to is this idea. So that you say in the book, you know, there is masculine order and feminine chaos. Mm -hmm. I, no, actually, I say that those are symbolic representations of the two things. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. So why? Why is order masculine? Um, I think it's because our primary social hierarchy structures are fundamentally masculine. And that's not the patriarchy? Well... It's not the modern idea of the patriarchy, that's for sure. I mean, that's, so that's my idea of the patriarchy, which is a, a system of male dominance of society. Yeah, but that's not my sense of the patriarchy. So what's, what's yours? Well, in what sense is our society male dominated? Uh, the fact that the vast majority of wealth is owned by men, the vast majority of capital and is owned by men. Women do more unpaid well, labor. a very tiny proportion of men and a huge proportion of people who are seriously disaffected are men. Most people in prison are men. Most people who are uh, on the street are men. Most victims of violent crime are men. Most people who commit suicide are men. Uh, most men, most people who die in wars are men. People who do worse in school are men. It's like, where's the dominance here precisely? What you're doing is you're taking a tiny substrata of hyper successful men and using that to represent the entire structure of, the, of Western society. There's nothing about that that's vaguely appropriate. But I could say equally well that most rape victims are women. You know, terrible things happen to people of both sexes. And you could say that with, with, with perfect utility, but that doesn't provide any evidence for the existence of a male-dominated patriarchy. Well, there it are just means that terrible things happen to both genders, which they certainly do. But there are almost no women who rape men, for example. So that is an asymmetry there in sexual violence. 
Well, yes, there's an, as there's an asymmetry in all sorts of places, but that doesn't mean that Western culture is a male-dominated patriarchy. The fact that there are asymmetries has nothing to do with your basic argument. No, but you might this equally... Is, this is a trope that people just accept. Western society is a male-dominated patriarchy. It's like, no, it's not. That's not true. And, and even, if it, even if it has a patriarchal structure to some degree, the, uh, the fundamental basis of that structure is not power. It's competence. That's why our society works. It's only when a, when a structure degenerates into tyranny that the fundamental relationships between people become dependent on power. It's not power. If you hire a plumber who's likely to be male, it's not because there's roving bands of tyrannical plumbers forcing you to make that choice. And it's the case with almost every interaction that you have at the face of our culture. You're dealing with people who are offering a service of one form or another, who are usually part of the broad middle class, and who offer, and what you're looking for is the person who can offer the best service, and you can find it. It's not a consequence of being dominated by anything that's tyrannical. And, and then again, our culture, our Western culture, um, which is by no means perfect, and certainly has tyrannical elements, like all cultures do, is the least tyrannical society that's ever been produced, and certainly the least tyrannical society that exists now. So where's the patriarchy exactly in all of this? Well, saying that it's the least tyrannical society is not the same as saying it's not a tyrannical society. That's exactly why I said it was the least right. tyrannical society. But that's society. what I mean. So you haven't debunked the existence of patriarchy then. You've said that actually now is better for women. I don't have to debunk it. Women. You have to demonstrate its existence. Okay, well, let's go through it. I'm writing a book about feminism in the moment. Uh, until 1919, there were professions that women were barred from. They simply were not allowed to do it. Until 1880s... Why would you blame men for that? Because who was in those professions? Who was guarding entry to those professions? Who was worried about losing their status if women became what do you think doctors? What was the emancipated women in the 20th century, just out of curiosity? Well, a couple of different things. I think it was technology. I think it was the pill helped enormously okay, so because it gave that, people... When was that developed? Well, in the 60s. Right, so that and wasn't 1919. No, but I also right, think it was a series tampons? of legal changes that started in Britain with the Married Women's Property Act, which said for the first time women are full legal beings under the law. They can own property. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is a structure that has continued throughout from a time when women didn't have the same legal rights as men to now when they mostly do mm -hmm. but culture still lags behind it i don't think you and i are necessarily talking at such cross purposes it's just that your conception of patriarchy as i see it in the book is that quite a lot of men are quite nice and they do nice things for women and no that, that's not my conception of patriarchy you, and i don't require men or advise them to be nice ever we, well, you do talk about the guy who's the tampon king, the sanitary towel king of India, right? Well, I wouldn't call that nice. Okay, I would what call would that brave. Okay. Did you read about his life when he was trying to develop that? Yeah. God, it was absolutely miserable, and he did it anyways. Right. He freed all sorts of women as a consequence. And I that's think that was... nice. That's courageous. That's noble. That's visionary. It's not nice. I think and it is also nice. I think it is also well, something that is, you know, it is honouring your social obligations. Um... I'm not so sure that that's a social obligation because many other people would have done it had it been a social obligation. It, he, he said what he was concerned about. He saw that his wife was suffering with her monthly period and had to choose between feeding her family and taking care of herself properly and chose to feed her family and thought he would do something about that. That goes way past nice, especially given what he had to suffer through to do all the experimentation that produced his, his eventual technology. So, like, I, this whole patriarchy thing, I think you have no idea how pernicious and dangerous it is. Well, no, you I know, don't. Men I and really women don't. Go on. Throughout history, have fundamentally cooperated to push back against the absolute catastrophe of existence a terrible death rate, the, the probability of chronic starvation, early death, disease, the difficulty of raising children, with all the death that was associated with that, and to look backwards in time and say, well, basically what happened was men took the upper hand and persecuted women in this tyrannical patriarchy. It's an absolutely dreadful misreading of history. It's a terrible thing to teach young women, and it's a horrible thing to inflict upon men. I mean, I absolutely disagree with you. I think that's like saying slavery in the US was actually most people cooperate. Well, no, you didn't. You had a system where one set of people owned another set of people. And until women got full legal rights, they could own property for themselves, they could work. Essentially, they were owned. They were you're first attributing their owned lowest, by their fathers and then their by their husbands. Status to the domination by men. You yeah. already said that you thought that what emancipated women primarily in the 20th century was technological revolution. No, not okay, primarily, so but that's it? one of two. I think that's it's two not things. not primarily, eh? No, you I don't th think the pill was a primary force in the emancipation of women. I think or the was... invention of, of tampons, let's say, or the, or the provision of proper sanitary uh, facilities, uh, toilets and that sort of thing. 
You're, you're, you're thinking instead it was the action of courageous feminists in the 1920s that produced a social revolution that overthrew the patriarchy. That's your theory. Yeah, I That's think... That's a foolish theory. Well, I'm very sorry to hear you say that, but I think to quote you in the Kathy Newman interview, I think it's a multivariate, right? I think there are lots of different things that all contributed to well, women gaining rights. Well, then let's not be assuming that the Western society was a tyrannical patriarchy. Well, no, that's then, one of them, and assumption. then other things happened as well. So you have the pill, you have the dishwasher and white goods, labour-saving devices in the home. I think all of those were really important. But you also have things like campaigns for the vote. Yes, you also have things like that, yes. So how, when in a system that existed in England until 1918, when... Why half would you even want to look at history like that? Like, what, what's, your, what's your goal? Because exactly. I think the people who don't look at history are condemned to repeat it. And I think that we are... We're gonna, what are we going to do? Repeat the, the persecution of women? Do you yeah. think that's a realistic possibility? Yeah, we're sitting and here... How do you see that? We're sitting happening? here in America, right, where we've just had a fifth judge appointed to the Supreme Court who is now anti-abortion, who's now conservative. I think that abortion rights are absolutely fundamental to women being able to function as full humans in society. And I think that is now under threat in America. I think it is extremely smug and complacent to think civilization has peaked, it's all upwards from here. Yeah, well, um, good luck with that, I suppose. <laughs> it's a living. Like, I, you know, I, I, there are lots of people who agree with me, there are lots of people clearly who agree with you. Um, I wanted no, to there are just a lot of people, I would say, who are coming to listen to what I say because they're sick and tired of having their desire to move forward in the world and to achieve something and to take their place as adult males, let's say, who are under the weight of accusations that their ambition and forthrightness is a manifestation of something that's fundamentally tyrannical. They're not happy with that. It's not doing anyone any good. And it's also not true. It's really a terrible thing to do to young men. And it's happening all the time. That's why they're bailing out of universities like mad. There won't be a man left in the social sciences in 10 years in the universities, and it's no bloody wonder. It's an unhospitable place, and it's unhospitable precisely because of this doctrine. It said that throughout history, the fundamental relationship between men and women was one of power, essentially slavery. It's like, fine, believe it if you want. It's not going to do your relationships any good, I can tell you that. So. Okay, well, well, we'll see how that one goes. I'm, mm. I'm currently married, but it, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll raise it with him. Um, I think the university's example is a really fascinating one because you talk in the book about the fact that now women are a majority on two thirds of college courses in the U.S. Mm. Uh, and you know, I've also seen you saying, "Would well, you believe in equality of opportunity, but not equality of outcome?" Maybe it women. It isn't only that I don't believe oh. in equality of outcome. I think it's an unbelievably pathological wish and doctrine. Right, and it's but okay. dangerous. History has demonstrated exactly how dangerous it is. Equality of opportunity is something that anyone with any sense would support, but equality of outcome, it's... So what's your you problem with there not being... You beyond belief to, to, to support equality of outcome. Okay, so what's your problem with there not being enough men in the social sciences? Uh, perhaps women are just cleverer. Perhaps that's why there are more women at university, Could right? Be. Under your doctrine. I don't think that, but that's well, I think the logical the extension of your doctrine. The problem isn't the fact that there's an unequal distribution. The problem I have with it is that the reason that men are bailing out is because of the prevalence of the doctrine that you're espousing. That's the problem I have with it. It doesn't matter that much. They will bail out. I don't see any way that the universities are going to redeem themselves in the next decade. So, and, and maybe that will be fine, but I doubt it. We'll That's, see. That seems extremely pessimistic when the, majority, the numbers of people going to university just generally are going up. Yeah, well, that's not going to last for very long. Why not? Because it's too expensive and the universities are doing all sorts of things that aren't um, acceptable, mostly racking up the price, ratcheting up the price. So, and, and decreasing the quality of what they're offering and playing into the hands of the people who are ideological acolytes of the identity politics routines and playing postmodern stunts and pushing neo-Marxism and all these things that are characteristic of, of the social sciences and the humanities primarily. See, this is where I find you, you fascinating to me because, you know, you talk in these quite apocalyptic terms. I think that, you know, someone who will listen to that and think, wow, there's a really big problem. But what we're really talking about is some irritatingly postmodern professors and some students with blue hair and funny ideas about gender in a handful of uh, courses around America if and Western If that's what we Western were talking Europe. about, no one would have paid attention to me for more than about 15 minutes. So you might see this as some surface manifestation that's irrelevant, but that isn't how most people view it. Ah, it's okay. certainly the case, too, that this identity politics battle of ideas was a determining factor in the last American election. If Hillary wouldn't have played identity politics, played cozy with the identity politics types, she would have kept the working class and she would be president now. So these aren't trivial issues.
by okay. any stretch of the imagination. It's not just some kids having a decent time while they're being creatively rebellious at university. It's a much deeper problem than that. The doctrine, the doctrines that I'm opposed to are predicated on, well, one assumption they're predicated on, it's probably the primary assumption, is that the best way to view history is as the domination of a tyrannical male patriarchy, and that's true also particularly of the West, which is a doctrine I find absolutely unpalatable and historically absurd, biologically ridiculous and ungrateful, among other things. Who's, ungr of, who's ungrateful, sorry, in that? Who is being ungrateful? Look at what you have. We right. live in the best society that's ever been created. You know, I was reading about some Indonesians. I mean, do you mean me as a woman or me as a 21st us. century person in, in the world? I mean us, yeah. I mean, you, I'm incredibly you. grateful for what I have, but the, to me the then project of politics is... the construction of a tyrannical patriarchy? You're grateful for the productions of a tyrannical patriarchy. How does that make sense? Because I think life is good. I think it could be better. That, that's, that's what being fine. a progressive means. That's a perfectly means. reasonable proposition. But, I guess but you that isn't commensurate with your claim that you're the beneficiary of a tyrannical patriarchy. Why not? How can it be good if it's the consequence of a tyrannical patriarchy? Tyranny isn't good, is it? I mean, that's the definition of tyranny. Something that isn't good, and yet it's produced all these things that you're grateful for. Like, doesn't that contradict and contradiction bother you? Where did, where did what was good come from? Where is, well, I think, from, I think I'm benefiting, actually, from a lot of things that I don't support, that are unearned privileges in my life. I think that's absolutely true. Like your job? Like I have a very good job. I had a loving family. Quit. Who, who, well, I don't think that's going to do the world any good, is that's it? That's a hell of a fine rationalization for your privileged position. Oh, well, fair enough. But, I, you know, if... You I, could trade it off with someone who's less privileged. I could. That'd be a start. I could. I could do that. And, and, uh, but I don't, I don't want to, and I, and I won't, and I don't think I should be expected to. Why not? Is it okay for you to occupy a position of privilege in the patriarchal tyranny? And if it is, is it because you're female? Or is it just because it's convenient? Well, let me tell you my political philosophy. I'm a, I guess I'm a social democrat. So what I believe is that you should, if you have a good life, you should try and pass that on. I believe in a progressive redistributive tax system, for example. It was once said by Lord Mandelson in British politics, you know, but New Labour was okay with people being filthy rich as long as they paid their taxes. Now, I'm kind of less okay with people being filthy rich. But Define what I filthy do, rich. Well, that, I think I would leave that You're to... You're probably in the top one-tenth of one percent of people who've ever lived on the planet. That would constitute filthy rich by historical standards. Okay, but I'm not so sure where, that where I'm going to be line exactly? able to help the Neanderthals at this point, really, by giving up some money. But this is my point, is that what I believe is, I believe in a structure in which people who have had a good life and had lots of advantages should pay that back, pay that forwards, which I think is the message that you preach as well, right? You have responsibilities. And if you've had, like us, a, right, a lot of advantages in life. I don't civilization as a tyrannical patriarchy. Well, it's not purely a tyrannical That's patriarchy, That's for sure. Is it? It's purely not. Right. And that's exactly the issue. But why because would you when deal you describe with it as a tyrannical tenure? patriarchy, then you make a case that it's purely that. And that's exactly what's ungrateful. Why it's not purely that at all. Why it saying that something has elements, elements of this made that the same as it is said. purely that? That isn't what's being said. Merely to define it as a patriarchy implies unidimensionality. Uni uni and to insist that that's also tyrannical doesn't offer a balanced viewpoint at all. Well, I think that's so. probably where, yeah, I think that's probably where your disagreement comes with this, which is because I do not see it in that way. I do not see that as univariate at all. I see it as one then element. Then why call many. it a patriarchy? Because it describes an overarching structure. Does it? Yeah. Well, what if the patriarchy is fundamentally composed of women? Is it still a patriarchy? No, that would be a matriarchy. Would it? So let's say we take a patriarchal structure, like yeah. the medical profession, and we fill it primarily with women. Is it then a matriarchal structure? What makes it a patriarchy to begin with? Is it the hierarchical structure? Is it, is it the fact that it's mostly men? Is it the sociological structure? Or is it the fact that it's mostly men? Well, I think that's really interesting because male primary school teachers, for example, only 15% of them are men. And I interviewed mm. some of them for my book. And you know what? They report exactly the same things that women do in male-dominated offices, right? They say, people have conversations that I feel excluded from. I feel stigmatized, like I shouldn't be here. People look at me askance when I say I'm a primary school teacher and I'm a man. You know, they kind of reel back. We all make those implicit associations. So, and so if, it is, if it is a structure that's dominated by women, then it's also a tyrannical patriarchy. I think in that case, then men have a, a way of they should be able to complain about the fact that a very female dominated office leaves them feeling out too yeah feeling left out so too. how do we get something that isn't a tyrannical patriarchy if it's composed of women and it's a tyrannical patriarchy and if it's composed of men it's a tyrannical patriarchy we're kind of out of options 
Correct, but well, or you can have a blend, an office in which a blend of people of both sexes work. So if it's work. fifty fifty, then it's not a tyrannical patriarchy. No, not fifty fifty. I'm saying that people. Uh, Forty sixty. I'm saying that so there is clearly when there is only fifteen percent of male primary school teachers, they do feel marginalised and excluded. So. So you think the h defining hallmark of a tyrannical social structure is the predominance of one gender, and if that was if that was relatively equalised, then all of a sudden it would be a free and an no, open institution. I don't think that that male primary school teachers are being tyrannised, I do think they are being marginalised and I do think that they feel excluded and stressed by that. So what do you do about that. that? Well, this is what I mean. I think actually, and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised you don't agree with me on this, that actually having more male primary school teachers would be a really good thing because boys need role models, actually. People, particularly boys who don't have a father figure in their life, that's mm. really important for them to have a stable adult who shows them what it's like to be a man around the place. Could be, but you shouldn't achieve it as a consequence of preferential hiring. No, I don't think it would need necessarily need to be preferential hiring. I think it would, it would probably be about making that job, breaking down the stigma to entering that job. I think teaching is a really interesting example. It was seen at the turn of... I worked in daycares when I was 18, 19. Right. You know, there were no men in it. And how did that make you lot. feel? I loved it. Yeah. You know, the kids, I used to wrestle with the kids, which of course can't do now because everybody knows that that would just be a catastrophe. And I used to draw them pictures of monsters and they'd line up for that. And I liked working with kids quite a lot. And I didn't care whether it was female dominated. I've been in female dominated my professions my whole life. You write in 12 Rules for Life about having had violent impulses that you didn't act on. And I think in Maps of Meaning, you elaborate on that. You say you fantasize about stabbing a classmate in the neck. And you say you're very clear about the fact that you, you know, you've never ever thought that you would take those seriously. But it just does make me think whether or not are you somebody who thrives on anger, who finds anger to be something that they need in their life that they find motivates them to do the things that they need to do. Those are two different questions. Okay, you can so answer them both. One is whether I thrive on it, and the answer to that is most certainly not. So I actually don't like conflict. It's then how have you ended me. up doing this as a job? Which is arguing with people, right? Just because you, no, that's not my job. It's not to argue with people. Okay. So my job is to not do things that I don't think I should do. Right, and my government made the mistake of assuming that compelled speech was acceptable as long as it was motivated by hypothetical compassion. And that's not happened for me. So I made that point. It wasn't because I wanted to or because I enjoyed it. I don't really like conflict. I'm actually a rather agreeable person, which is partly why I'm a clinician. And so um, I find the, the constant conflict exhausting. But that's not the issue. I'm, you're not morally obligated you're morally obligated to do things other than that which you like. So now I really do enjoy the lecture series that I'm doing. And the reason for that is that it's not political in its essence. I'm trying to do everything I can to bring people who are trying to develop a vision for their life together and to encourage them to act more responsibly, but, but not in a finger wagging sort of way, but because I've come to understand that the meaning that sustains you in life is mostly to be found through responsibility. And through the voluntary adoption of responsibility, you're very likely to find your fundamental strength. And I think that that's clinically unassailable observation. Um, and so, and that's all very good, and I'm very pleased to be doing it. And it seems to be having a salutary effect, as far as I can tell. And, um, but but it's not because I thrive on anger. I mean, you were at my show, what, two On two Thursday days ago? night, yeah. How much anger was there in that? Well, I thought it was fascinating because it was in Long Island. Um, mm -hmm. I drove, we drove to it and we went past a Lamborghini dealership, a, a Porsche dealership. You know, this is not a poor area. Mm -hmm. The audience was, I would say, very like, as I was surprised how many women there. It was pretty mixed. It was overwhelmingly white. And I thought you talked, uh, you know, you said at the end, oh, this is more incoherent than I normally am. You ranged across quite a range of subjects from, you know, status in monkeys to perception. But the things that the crowd clapped and they applauded were where you went, oh, you can't say that, that's a microaggression. Mm -hmm. Or multiculturalism is a, you know, is a scourge that is sweeping Canada. And what I got was a strong Snow sense... that has swept Canada. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, what I got was a very strong sense of people whose lives... I never said that it was a scourge that swept Canada either. I wouldn't have said that. Okay, I'm well, I, I will go back and that. check your exact wording of what you mm -hmm. said, but you definitely... I'm not in favour of it as a fundamental doctrine. Right, okay. But so I don't think it's a scourge. So I wonder if you and I mean the same thing when we talk about multiculturalism, because you have uh, a First Nations room in your house, right? You have a mm -hmm. lot of First Nations stuff. 
-hmm. How is the coexistence and of... the honorary member of a First Nations family, as a right, matter of fact. It's wonderful. I have a, uh, you know, a First Nations artist mm -hmm. when I'm from when I went to Canada last year. But that, to me, is the essence of Canadian multiculturalism, living that culture being preserved and living alongside the Anglophone culture that, in some sense, has supplanted it. How is that not multiculturalism? Well, multiculturalism is the idea that the cultures can all be put together in a single place with no overarching structure or undergirding structures. Like, that's not the case. How can that possibly be the case? That defines the situation in the world. And the world is full of war. So how, does the, how can that possibly work? If you're going to bring people together and they're, going to be, and they're going to exist together in harmony, they have to be playing a game that everyone plays, that everyone knows the rules for. It can't be ten different sets of rules for different people. That isn't going to work. So it's, it's absolutely naive to believe. How, if that worked, the world wouldn't be full of war. Well, before we had, you know, multiculturalism, we still did have war. War, in fact, war is, as Stephen Pinker, I'm sure you've read your Stephen Pinker says, you know, this is the least violent time in human history. So yes, something well, is working. that's a consequence of the working. patriarchal tyranny. Well, if you think that the patriarchy has been eroded over the last hundred years, maybe that's what it's down to. Maybe you could give some credit to it for that. Mm, I actually didn't say that the patriarchy had been eroded. Well, and you know, because you don't believe it exists in the first place. Fair enough. Mm. But I, my definition of multiculturalism is citizenship based, right? So you can be both Canadian and First Nations. You can be both Quebecois and also Canadian. Uh, you yeah, know, but that means that everybody in the multicultural milieu is one thing and another. Right. But they're all one thing and another. Yeah. Yeah, well, but you know, our Prime Minister said, well, there is no Canadian identity. It's like, well, okay, what is it that unites us? Well, well nothing. We all protect our cultures. It's like, well, that leads to war. Okay, that well, doesn't only lead to war, obviously, but unless you have people operating within a shared framework of perception and value, they can't cooperate and compete uh, peacefully. I, there's, I don't understand how that's even a disputable topic. That's how you organize people. Okay, I, I think, if business. that's what he said, that's what Trudeau said, that is a dumb thing for the Prime Minister of Canada to say when you are Prime Minister of Canada. I yeah, you might, you might say that. I would agree right. much more mm. with what Barack Obama said when he said, you know, I'm trying not to make a red states America or blue states America or white America, black America. I'm trying to make a united states America. That to me yes, is... Yes, the Democrats are very good at that. Well, they, they well, try... They've played identity politics for the last 20 years. All they've done is inflame tribal, tribal tendencies, as far as I can tell. So he can say that, but it isn't obvious that it's the case. And it's not obvious to me at all that one of the consequences of Barack Obama's presidency was a reduction in racial tension in the United States. No, I wouldn't agree with that either. I think a lot of people found having a black college-educated professor very alarming and threatening to their idea well, of themselves of them as the dominant group. not enough to stop them from voting for him twice. No, that is very true, but again... It's fundamentally true, right? It's, it's really the crucial issue at hand here. No, but he built a big coalition of white, well-educated liberals and people of colour. I mean, that is, the, that is the Democrat electoral... Well, how do you explain the rise of racial tension in the United States then? Well, I think it's caused by a lot of things, not the least of one of which is the Republican Party inflaming it. You talk about the left playing identity politics, I think the right play identity politics all the time. The right doesn't dominate the universities. No, and but it dominates, talk, but example, Donald Trump is president, so realistically... Donald Trump is hardly a typical Republican. No, he, I used to say that he... Accomplished In fact, most of, for most of his life, if I remember correctly, he was a Democrat. Right, I don't think he has right. any so political... So we're not going to blame Donald Trump on the right wing. Okay, but I'm going to say the rest of the Republican Party are also quite happy to play, I would say, white identity politics. They, go, they did not d dump him as their candidate when he said, Mexicans, they're not sending us their best people here, they're rapists, right? The whole idea of the United States, it said, I think a beautiful thing, all men are created equal, but it meant men, and it meant specifically white men, women and black people could not vote. The US was founded on identity politics. This is not some new concept that has come along in the last 20 years. The United States wasn't founded on identity yes, politics. Yes, it was. That's an absolutely absurd proposition. The United States was founded on the same principles that, um, what would you say, that, that played their powerful role through the development of, of, of English democracy. And that was nested inside a Judeo-Christian view that fundamentally presumed that both men and women were made in the image of God and that all people had divine value. And it took a long time for that set of ideas to fully manifest itself in the political realm. But to consider that a manifestation of identity politics is, I, I, I can't imagine why you would possibly do that. I don't consider that a manifestation of identity politics. I consider having a constitution that says only some people are citizens to be a manifestation of identity politics. Well, what do you think changed it across time? 
And, uh, and, and, and look, let's get our definition straight here. You can't lump all occurrences of uh, non-equal treatment into the category of identity politics. Identity politics is a very specific thing. It's really only existed since the 1970s. You can't go back into to 1770 and say that the founders of the American Constitution were playing identity politics. They were you playing politics that, that was based on identity. That's my definition of identity that's politics. That's not the definition of identity politics unless you pay, play fast and loose with the definition. Identity politics is something that's... Im no one talked about identity politics 20 years ago or 30 years ago. It's a new term. You, you can't say that people's proclivity to identify with their group is identity politics. That's just tribalism. And that's like, who knows how old that is? A million years old. 500,000 years old. And you're going to call tribalism identity politics? That, well, that's not helpful. If you want to talk about tribalism, we could talk about tribalism. But identity politics is something that's nested inside a po particular political view of the world. It's got a Marxist basis, and it manifests itself in postmodernism. And it emerged in the American Union, France first in the 1970s, and then has swept through the American universities and increasingly the rest of the West since then. That's identity politics. If you want to talk about tribalism, that's fine. I'm not a fan of tribalism, which is why I don't like the identity politics types. And I don't care if they're on the right or the left. I think the right-wing use of identity as the primary marker for human categorization is as reprehensible and dangerous as it is on the left. My problem with the left at the moment, the fundamental problem with the radical left, is that they're hyper-dominant in academia. And that's not good. And that's not my opinion. You can go look at Jonathan Haidt's data and see for yourself. And he's as moderate a person as you could hope to find. And probably less prone to anger than me. And, and I agree with you. I find a lot of students phenomenally irritating. But I would question how much power they have it's in contrast the to the things that I find more worrying that are happening in the world today, right? Or even the professors, right? Even Look, the professors. 20-year-olds don't have that much power, but they're not 20 forever. 10 years later, they're 30. And, and 20 years later, they're 40. Right. And, and whatever happens in the university happens everywhere five years later. And very, very sadly for people in my politics, left-wing politics, what happens to people as they get older is that they've traditionally got more conservative. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can make a case that the, the, the current, where people are where they're 20 today is actually going to be the ideology that takes them all the way through their life. That's never been the case no, but so it'll be far. No, but it'll be around long enough to do plenty of damage, like it already is. Okay, but so. even if we accept that students and their POMO professors are quite annoying, which I think is probably I agree, something I it's agree not, with They're not on. just annoying. Like, they're destroying the universities, and that's not a good thing. And they're particularly destroying the social sciences and the humanities. The sciences are safe so far, but not for long because the scientists in particular are terrible at politics and the left-wing activists are great at politics and so they'll win eventually. The National Science Foundation is already introducing diversity requirements for hiring in mathematics in universities. It's like good luck with that. That's not going to work. There are hardly any mathematical geniuses. If you start putting all sorts of arbitrary restrictions on their hiring, you're just going to not end, you're going to end up not finding the ones that there are. So. Okay, let's talk about free speech to finish on. You write in your book about Nietzsche, who became the Nazis' favourite intellectual, and you also talk about a, a professor... Only through his sister's mistranslations of his work. Right, but you talk a little bit as well about uh, another professor whose ideas you thought led in never to be to kind of Maoism, and you said, I don't know how he can't be more worried about where his ideas lead. Do you worry about where, you, you know, where your work might be taken and, and used by other people? I saw you posing of with... Um, I worry about that all the time. ...with a Pepe flag. Oh, I can't believe you brought that up. Right, but I just think it's... The, to Seriously, you, I yeah. can't believe you brought that up. You should go online. Yeah, I do. There, there's a... Believe an, me, I do. An, there's a video uh, called... I think it's called, Is Jordan Peterson a Darling of the Alt-Right? Have you, have, you have you watched the video of the person who put up that Pepe flag with me? He's no, online. But I Go have, watch it. I have seen... You wouldn't, I would say... And why are you concerned about Pepe anyways? Jesus, he disappeared like three years ago. It is... And most of that was trolling by young guys who were trying to drag the media into idiot accusations like the idea that this was a white supremacist gesture, which I was asked about on CBC. It's like, no, it wasn't. It was Fortran trolls playing the media for fools, which worked. And much of the peppy thing was that as well. Okay, but the problem with people ironically pretending to be Nazis on the internet... They weren't pretending to be Nazis. But no, this is a separate phenomenon, and the 4chan definitely do ironically pretend to be all of the worst things they can possibly be, is that some people take that very seriously. There was a case in America recently of a guy who stabbed his father because he had thought that his father was a Democrat, He'd got very, he was writing stuff for um, a conservative website. 
he'd got very into the Pizzagate conspiracy theory. He was probably paranoid. Right. So there are people yeah, who take this stuff very, paranoid. very seriously and yeah, they latch onto it. What's your point? I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, how much responsibility do you feel that you have, particularly guys at the alt-right who, as you say, some of them have enjoyed your work and say, no, I'm, not one of, I'm not one of you guys. I'm not with you guys. They haven't enjoyed my work. I've definitely read bits on the internet. Read what? more. Okay. Find some evidence. I'm, I'm extraordinarily sick and tired of this particular accusation slash line of questioning. I'm no fan of the identitarian right, the ethno-nationalists, the alt-right. First of all, what do you mean by alt-right exactly? Do you mean ethno-nationalists? Do you mean white supremacists? No, I mean people who are on the right but have got their power base outside the traditional media. They see themselves as an alternative. So I see them coming That's a up pretty loose definition through that of the strain alt-right. of Rush Limbaugh kind of um, talk radio, right? People who see themselves in opposition to an Rush establishment. Rush Limbaugh is not the alt-right. No, he's been around for 30 years. Right, so he's the progenitor of what I see now, Breitbart and things like that, are the new media version of that very old media Well, let's format. define what constitutes alt-right first. For me, they're ethno-nationalists. They tend to be white supremacists. And generally, when people tar me with an alt-right epithet, the reason they're doing that is to associate me with those people. They don't like me. And the reason for that is that as may, I've made it very clear, not only in my videos, but on Twitter, that I don't like them. I don't like their anti-Semitism. I don't like their use of identity politics. I don't agree with their aims. I think that their notion is something like, well, if everybody's going to play identity politics, we're going to play it too, and we're going to win. And I can certainly understand that motivation, but I think it's a bad game all around. And I think the only reason that I was ever associated in any sense whatsoever with anything to do with the alt-right was because it was extremely convenient of the radical leftists, who I fundamentally detest, to paint me as a representative of that viewpoint. Right. The, other than that, zero. And I thought that was fascinating because to me you don't look like somebody who has particularly suffered an outrageous amount for your opinions. People have certainly disagreed. They've been rude. They've, you know, they've in some cases... The only reason I haven't suffered an outrageous amount for my opinions is because I've handled the consequence of their utterance exceptionally well. My job was at risk. My career was at risk. My family stability was at risk. So I, I wouldn't push that one too far. In what way was your job at risk? Jesus. Last year, 200 of my fellow faculty members signed a petition to get me fired. That was only one of a dozen things that happened. The university wrote me two letters, two cease and desist letters from their HR departments with their legal staff. Three of those and you're done. They just fired Rick Maida in Canada at Acadia University for talking about many of the same things that I've talked about. So the fact that I've come through this relatively unscathed has very little to do with the vitriol of the attacks. There was plenty of motivation to take me out. It just didn't work. Right. And I think the fact that it didn't work, to me, makes me ultimately optimistic about where we are because I've... Why? Because I've twer I went on, I did a, a panel a while ago with Zaganara, a, a Burmese comedian, who was imprisoned for making a joke, right? And mm. we are not yet at that stage. I think, undoubtedly, I get... We're not. We're damn close. Really? Um, how about the guy with the pug in the UK? Count Dankula. That's the one. Right, but he did actually, I mean... That, that, he that was a joke. I, you I, might not have liked it. I didn't say it was a good joke. I didn't say it was an appropriate joke. I didn't say any of that. I didn't say it was a well thought through joke. But it was a joke. Yeah, I don't. I just fundamentally not, don't believe that it was a joke. I believe that it was camouflaged yep. as a joke, and that's what it kind of comes yeah, across. Right. And I well, that's that exactly what you would believe if you were inclined to persecute comedians. No, I'm not inclined to persecute someone. Well, you're inclined to persecute him. I don't think he's a comedian, and I don't think... Um, I, 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 I would have to go and look at the circumstances of that case, but I, I think... He didn't like his girlfriend's pug and thought he would teach it to do something reprehensible as a joke. Right, but I see you getting involved, say, tweeting Douglas Murray's article about Tommy Robinson, and I think mm -hmm. you see that as a free speech issue, and that's not how I see Tommy Robinson's case at all. I see that as contempt of court, someone who endangered a grooming mm -hmm. trial. Mm -hmm. How do you see that case? I see it as very fortunate that Tommy Robinson didn't die in prison. I think I would say that about a, a lot of people in prison. I think it's very hard to be in prison if you are a sex offender, for example. I think our Br British prisons are less inhumane than American prisons, but they are still brutal places to be. However, I do think that was an appropriate punishment for somebody who tried to collapse a grooming trial. Well, but are you? I guess are you, are you a, sorry? Are you a prison abolitionist? 
No. Oh, right, okay. So you do believe that some people, need, there are offences for which people need to go to prison. Why would you ask me a question like that? Well, do I look interested. like someone who isn't interested in meeting out appropriate punishment? No, but I just thought maybe I've made an assumption about you. And I didn't want to make an assumption about you.